Let's just put the volume on that and just see if that's okay. Could be a feedback because he had it on Zoom before. Yeah. Huh? Okay, just open them all up. Looks good. We're on live now. Okay. Okay. Welcome back to uh, one of our less frequent uh, CBD lockdown uh, meetings. Um, we've put together a set of three here, uh, myself and my uh, good friend and colleague, Chris Kelly, to help dentists educate themselves a bit more about how they could help their patients who have uh, poor sleep and what we call sleep disordered breathing problems. Now, in the past, Chris and I have talked a lot about adults. Um, and the uh, use of oral appliance therapy. Tonight, I want to specifically talk about uh, kids. And um, in case you don't realize, um, sleep disorder sort of breathing problems are as common in kids as they are in adults. And we're going to share some statistics with you uh, that may shock you and may make you realize that as part of your initial screening exam for every child or adolescent in your practice, you should be asking certain questions about their quality of sleep and their performance uh, uh, at school and, um, you know, do they snore, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I'll just check that everything's working. Uh, is, is, can you see it? Great. Okay. And then can I get back to that PowerPoint here? Um, so Chris, uh, you can see on the screen there. Say hi to everyone, Chris. Hello, everyone, Chris. <laughs> Chris and I will literally be doing uh, a combined presentation. The slides that have the full face logo, I'll talk to, and the um, the other ones uh, uh, with the AER logo, Chris will. So basically, I'm going to give you the clinical setting, and Chris is going to help you to integrate that clinical setting um, uh, into your practice. And uh, Chris has come up with some really good uh, questionnaires. Uh, he's got access to some amazing gadgets. I always call Chris uh, a bit like Joe the Gadget Man. Every time uh, uh, I say, look, Chris, how can we make this easier? Uh, uh, he, he, it, it, it happens. And um, uh, if you've used Chris's services before, you know how amazing they are pretty much all around Australia. I don't know, and New Zealand as well. You're doing your uh, sleep studies in New Zealand? Yep, in New Zealand, yep. Yeah. So it's, it's literally like um, Uber Eats of uh, sleep medicine. Um, you, you, The patient goes into an app, they book a sleep study, they organise with their GP for the referral, it's done under Medicare, and it just works amazingly. And Chris scores the studies himself, and he's really accurate, and he looks for uh, – uh, sorry, I'll just turn that off. <laughs> Mine will go off next. And he looks at, um, uh, you know, the bruxism uh, scores, which dentists are interested in, which unfortunately most sleep physicians don't really focus on because they're only interested in, you know, apnea, yes, no, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, tonight I'm going to uh, talk about uh, pediatric screening. And I'm using the word screening because, remember, unless you are a pediatric sleep physician, you can't actually diagnose um, this condition and it's a medical condition. So what we're trying to show you here is how if you throw the net out, you can help um, get the masses into an area that those who most need the care, as opposed to not screening anyone and saying it's all too hard and it's all too expensive and no one's going to pay $1,000 for a sleep study, so you know we'll just give up, right? Um, so we've come up with a formula that works really well in clinical practice. Um, and parents love it. And honestly, when you help a parent understand what their kids' underlying problems are and you lead to a solution, they will never leave your practice. And they refer all their family uh, to you, right? So now, Chris, let me just see how this is going to go. Yep, I'm advancing onto the first slide. So um, uh, why are we here? Um this lockdown lecture is uh, about pediatric pulse oximetry screening. And uh, believe it or not, in Australia and New Zealand today, about one third of children snore. And I wonder how many dentists out there actually ask that question. It's a simple question to um, their, uh, oops. Oh, well, geez. 
you know. So I did I lose the screen there, Chris? Can you still see? Yeah, I can see it. Yep. I don't know what happened there. Yeah. Um uh how many of you asked that question to your parents about their, their child? And uh, there's all sorts of apps you can download now that uh, helps you to confirm if a child's snoring by just putting that smartphone near the child that night. There's um, uh, questionnaires. I particularly like the Bears questionnaire, but there's a uh, there's a three or four on the market that ask certain questions that high of a high rating. So then you know that that could also be a problem, right? Um, but um, about 10% of those kids uh, snore most nights and 3 to 5% of the children have OSA symptoms. And that's where the danger comes in because it's the OSA that's depriving them of the uh, oxygen. Uh, it's the concept um, that they're not going to do well uh, in class. They're going to be less attentive. They're going to have more behavioral disorders. Remember, as adults, if we don't sleep well, we're tired and lethargic the next day. Um, for children, almost works the opposite. Uh, they, um, well, if you've had a child who uh, stayed up one hour past bedtime, you know, when they're young, what do they do? They start climbing the wall. So that hyperactive behaviour that many people misdiagnose as ADHD, uh, and that's not to say that ADHD doesn't exist, but it's to say that if you read the stats, you'll see more than 50% of the kids are misdiagnosed um, with ADHD. Really what they have is poor sleep. So here, you as the dentist can play a vital role in helping uh, in screening those um, those problems, right? So the, the potential for obstructive sleep apnea to impact on the health of a child is often underappreciated by parents or families, uh, and it's really not made, uh, raised enough uh, as a health issue um, with general practitioners. So that's where I think dentists uh, can be almost like what I call gatekeepers of the airway. So... Um, what are some of the symptoms uh, uh, of this disorder and uh, how can we help diagnose it? Well, if you listen to my previous lectures, you I go through a checklist. And uh, those who haven't, send me an email, info at DerekMahoney.com, and I'll send you my uh, screening checklist um, for kids and another one for adults. But for kids, you need to do, you need to ask certain questions and I'll go through those. You also need to examine the mouth, you know, uh, uh, you examine extra orally first. So I look for venous pooling, you know, signs of an allergic uh, crease on the nose, um, the open mouth posture. Uh, uh, then you look in the mouth, you see mouth breathers, gingivitis, you'll see a high palate, uh, cross bites. Um, you look in the uh, back of the throat, uh, you'll see a malamparty index that's compromised. You might see large tonsils. Um, the kid will kind of talk like that because of um, nasal obstruction problems. If you add CBCT to the equation, you're even picking up more. So really, there's no excuse for a general dentist not to be able to pick up which kids are at risk. But the problem has been, what then? If you send a kid for a um, overnight sleep study, many times the parents are not insured. Uh, the public waiting list is huge. Um, uh, privately, it's got a lot of uh, uh, money out of the pocket, et cetera, et cetera. So that's when you lose a lot of the patients. And so we've come up with an idea now where you can screen by just measuring their oxygen DSATs. And that's a very good predictor, depending on who you read, nearly 80% um, um, uh, accuracy. So again, we're doing this in two things. So what, what are we showing you here? Um, in this uh, in this comparison of adolescents not getting enough sleep, according to the National Sleep Guidelines, um, we're looking at the uh, people who are self-reporting, you know, what quality of sleep, how many hours they got uh, uh, versus the actual. And, and what do you see? You see a big disparity, not so much when they're little kids, but look at when they get to teenagers, right? And I'll talk later about uh, how serious this becomes. You look at some of the great research by Professor Ian Hickey uh, at Sydney University, um, uh, sleep and brain, uh, sleep and brain mind institute. Um, you, you'll see that Australia, unfortunately, is still up there with one of the highest rates of teenage suicide. And why is that? You know, um, uh, uh, well, what time do you think most of your teenage kids go to bed? Um, and, uh, even when they're in bed, what do you think they've got in front of them? Some sort of iPad, uh, which is uh, disrupting, um, their ability to uh, fall to sleep and then they have to get up for school the next day in time. And so, you know, days after days, weeks after weeks, years after years of this poor sleep behavior, what are you going to see? Increased um, 
anxiety, increase uh, mental health issues, depression, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, it's really important we look after our patients from a, a whole health point of view rather than just uh, look at um, uh, their, their teeth, right? So in this uh, statistic, and I'll just quickly sort of summarize it for you, uh, if you look uh, at the 12 to 13-year-olds not getting the uh, required minimum amount of sleep on school nights, According to the professional guidelines, it's uh, 25% boys, 29% girls. 86% of the boys and 70% of the girls felt they were getting enough sleep. So, you know, clearly uh, you don't ask the question, hey, do you think you're getting enough sleep? But then how can you check what their sleep's like? This is what it comes down to. And this is um, part of the uh, presentation that uh, we want to share with you tonight. And we're also happy if anyone uh, wants more information of giving you uh, the um, the papers to read and the uh, the two national guidelines. Chris, what are the two guidelines that you've uh, used to prepare this? One was the uh, uh, Australia, New Zealand. Yeah, the, the, the New Zealand guidelines are, are, are very clear on on pulse oximetry as a, as a tool uh, because they have a, a, a what is it, an organization over there called the starlight organization mm -hmm. which, like over here it's cancer but over there it's about sleep and um and they they've done a lot of heavy focus on pulse oximetry uh as a tool over there but the other um uh tool uh, the other um what is it a paper is um the australasian sleep association which covers both australia and new zealand i don't know if people are aware of this but sleep physicians actually can work in Australia and New Zealand if they're in Australia because it's the Australasian Sleep Association, you know. Uh, and uh, just on another uh, part, that those slides that you've been going through, they're they're. Um, I don't know if if I told you this, but they're actually, or I think you might have told me, but the the Law Society Admissions Centre yeah. actually did a study. Yeah. <laughs> These kids who aren't coming up to scratch are being judged by the Law Society Admission Centre, and that's a pretty high bar. Yeah. To, um, for for uh, looking at the uh, performance of children in school well, because of I, bad sleep. I know the study uh, Shokat et al. Uh, twenty fourteen. They looked at poor sleep quality and insufficient sleep uh, as far as mental health in adolescents, right? Uh, and I think those links are especially relevant. Uh, when you look at what's happening in Australia. Uh, we know that as lack of sleep increases, mental health problems increase. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, at 12 to 13, at 14 to 15, at 16 to 17 years, adolescents are not meeting the minimum sleep guidelines and are more likely to show symptoms of anxiety and depression and are less likely to report being happy. Uh, and as I said, uh, the Brain and Mind Institute at Sydney University has also shown that. and. Uh, um, I think uh, this slide is what you were referring to um, um, earlier, Chris. Uh, that's that uh, the uh, study is it Becker et al. I think uh, 2015. Um, yeah, yeah. Mm. Sleep sleep deprivation, anxiety, and depression uh, often occur sequentially with individuals, but um, the uh, LCAC, I think Law School Admission Council data across uh, multiple waves. Um, wanted to find out uh, whether the lack of sleep leads to poor mental health or if poor mental health predisposes adolescents uh, uh, to lack of sleep. Um, so of adolescents with symptoms of anxiety, 35%, this is at 12 to 13 uh, years, and 40% if you look at the 14 to 15 years, and then it gets worse, 59% at 16 to 17 years massive, did not, yeah, yeah. yeah did not mean, did not meet the minimum sleep guidelines, right? So that is considerably more than for those without anxiety symptoms, which if you look at the same cohorts are 25%, 22% and 49%. So it oh, means, sorry. yeah, go on Chris. Yeah. I mean, I, I know I've grown this long beard and that's not to say that I've become an Amish or anything, but take their phones away from them and see how less depressed they get, seriously. Yeah. Oh yeah. my God, yeah. I've got four boys. They're glued to it. I call it glow face. So, so I think, I mean, greater proportions of adolescents who rated themselves not happy compared to happy uh, did not meet the minimum sleep guidelines, right? Which is 59% compared to 48% of the 16 to 17 year olds, right? 
Um, mm -hmm. So I'm going to do one more slide and sort of bore you with some more sort of uh, stats. But I mean, I, I just want you to understand that Chris and I haven't made this up overnight. I want you to realize that this is an underlying problem under your nose in your practice every day. And, you know, you guys are still probing for periodontal depth and uh, uh, checking if your little sticky number six probe, if I remember right, uh, catches for a cavity. Yeah, look, that's important, but um, this is a far more uh, of importance. Uh, and me as an orthodontist, you know, if I have someone who has airway and um, uh, I don't look at that uh, and I'm just lining up their teeth and that's all I'm good at, I mean, isn't that the equivalent of me uh, straightening the deck chairs on the Titanic. I mean, what what's the point? I I, I just uh, you know I really have a very airway focused practice, and um, I think a lot of you are getting into the snoring of adults and uh, uh, maybe helping them with oral appliances. But it's the kids that really need the help because they never recover from this lack of cognitive uh, uh, performance. And if you look at uh, the excellent work of uh, uh, Stephen Sheldon, um, David Gazal. You know, they've clearly showed um, drops of IQ related to the sleep disordered breathing. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, if the average IQ, let's say, is 90 and you can show up to 10 units of IQ drop per year where this problem's not treated, what, what, do, you, what do you think those kids are going to be? That's why you find these kids are in the bottom of the class or in special needs classes, et cetera, uh, et cetera, right? So bottom line is sleep and physical health are intimately related. Poor physical health may affect sleep quantity and quality, and poor sleep may contribute to a large range of negative physical health outcomes, right? For example, adequate sleep has been linked to physical activity levels and body composition. So it's a bit catch-22. The, the obese kids are those who are getting poor sleep, and I don't want to launch into all the different uh, hormonal cascades, but definitely there's a link to increased uh, appetite, uh, increase then uh, eating uh, and poor sleep. So it's a catch-22. Uh, the putting on the weight predisposes you more to sleep apnea and poor sleep makes you eat more. So these are, you know, a lot of the uh, health issues. So body fat is associated with sleep duration in adolescence with overweight and obese adolescents having shorter sleep duration. And that paper is Sharkot et al, 2016. And remember the study that Chris uh, quoted uh, from the uh, 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 admissions board for the law association, around one in 13, 12 to 13 year olds, um, and one in 11, 14 to 15 year olds, and get this, one in nine, 16 to 70 year olds were obese. Okay, so I think you kind of see where we're getting uh, in that regard. Then you've uh, got the whole caffeine intake, right? So poor sleep, um, uh, staying up longer than they should, obesity, and then, of course, how do they try and stay awake? They start to drink more and more caffeine. What do you think that does to the uh, sleep cycle? So caffeine intake in the form of soft drinks, and I know that when my teenagers um, mm -hmm. were doing the HSC, it was V was the popular drink. Now it's uh, Red Bull, isn't it? I think Red Bull. Uh, yeah, I mean, look at look at that. There's When I was a kid, I wasn't allowed near the coffee machine. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, but but now you don't have to go to the coffee machine. You can buy soft drinks. Got caffeine. In. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Disguised in the same way. Yeah. Yeah. So um, so uh, now that there was a number of authors, but Obita, Overpick, Ramacharan, Kogan, and Ledsky in 2006 looked at um, the consumption of uh, caffeine and looked at the minimum sleep guidelines. And you know, obviously, they found uh, correlation. So you have less participation in sporting activities. Uh, you have, uh, more caffeine intake. You have greater obesity. And, you know, uh, wel welcome to Australia, I guess, with that. <laughs> uh, uh, so, so what, so this, yeah, I mean, I mean, the question is, what are we doing about it? how can we help screen these kids? Uh, so this lecture is obviously not about treatment. There's lots of treatment modalities. This lecture is how to screen so you can start helping these kids. And the future lectures Chris and I are going to do are going to help you with some simple treat, treatment uh, strategies. Chris, I'm going to hand over to you for this slide, which is going to uh, maybe make uh, a bit more sense uh, when people say, oh, yeah, but, um, you know, uh, I can't do a home sleep study for a um, 
a kid uh, under 18. Do you want to just lead into that? Yeah, well, uh, thanks, Derek. I think um, it, when I've come to your lectures over the years and uh, we get to that point where the paediatric sleep physician is standing in front giving fantastic information out, the the question always comes up that, oh, but, you know, it's so hard to get a sleep test for my child and everything else. Look, I mean, you, you're you dealing with this day in, day out. Um, you know, I've, I've only recently started helping you with some screening for, for children. But when it comes to those sleep studies, I mean, they get done, but they can be a bit of a delay and that can delay treatment. But in the end, you've got to think about how do I get a parent to to do this when they're busy and... Uh, in their life and everything else. So, you know, like the, the whole idea of, of pulse oximetry is not some sort of uh, catch-all to try and get people to do something else necessarily. It's, it's a really valuable tool. I mean, since its introduction in the 70s, it's become a common clinical tool. And, uh, but, you know, only recently, continuous recordings of pulse oximetry is, um, is, is a better application of this technology. So being able to record things all night with a with a tiny little thing on a child's finger it was unheard of even a couple of years ago i mean now sleep's a vulnerable time for breathing and it involves changes in the tone of the muscles as well as receptor changes in blood oxygen and responsiveness to those changes in blood oxygen now control stability is another thing even during these changes mildly or via sustained paroxysmal reductions which is fancy words for chemoreceptor peripheral receptor uh, feedback. Uh, the ventilation uh, and gas exchange uh, can, can affect the, the way a, a child sleeps, but repeated resolving of the cortical brain arousals that happen, which is where your muscle tone comes into full pelt, is your sweaty child in bed, essentially, uh, who's just, just not, well, they call it failure to thrive, don't they? Like it's a lack of putting on weight and that sort of thing. It can result in sleep disruption. Now, look, again, and we're going to say this a few times tonight because we don't want to put any noses out of joint, but the gold standard for the, um, for the, for the assessment of sleep quality and sleep uh, disorder breathing in adults and children is a polysomnogram. But limited channel studies like pulse oximetry provide useful data that may help a parent to decide to further investigate their children's health. Pulse oximeters in combination with uh, appropriate screening questionnaires is one of those limited channel studies that can assist the decision tree. And this is what we are talking about tonight. As with all screening like type level testing, it's critical to understand that the implications of that screening is, is uh, it, it, the, the implications of the screening can, can give rise to good information to help the parents make decisions and also in other things, which I'll go on about in a minute, but, but especially for pulse oximetry. So I'm, I'm gonna be talking about what the instrument measures uh, and reports, uh, as well as its limitations and how to interpret those results. Um, so in the next slide, uh, we've got some recommendations up here for, uh, the McGill score, which uh, is, a, is an interesting um, way to, to look at uh, this, and especially used in Australia, because you've got a thing called um, cluster events, and, uh, and I'll, I'll just talk about this. So in the broadest sense, a limited channel sleep study, it's like, uh, like pulse oximetry, relies on the presence of oxygen desaturations to give concrete evidence of sleep disorder breathing. I mean, in plainer English, it's one channel. It's, it's detecting pulse and oximetry. So you could say it's two channels, but it's really one channel. And it, if, it, if you're not, if you're not going to see uh, changes in oximetry, then you're not going to have a lot of evidence of anything. Um, so to, to make that a bit clearer, it, oximetry can add strong clinical data to support the clinical suspicion of obstructive sleep apnea. Um, well, more obstructive sleep apnea syndrome actually, uh, and provide weight to the accepted estimate of uh, what we call OSAS uh, severity. So pulse oximetry can assist in triaging the urgency of surgery. Um, it can also contribute to perioperative risk assessment. 
So, you know, the ENT can uh, have a great indication of what essentially they can talk to their anesthesiologist about with this child so that they can actually make sure that they're doing well after the surgery. So limitations of absolute positivity or the ruling out of OSA um, is, isn't, you can't rule out OSA with a pulse oximeter. Any low level testing, and because I'm a sleep scientist, you know, uh, we talk about this often, you've got different levels of testing and the higher the level of testing, the more ruling in and ruling out you can do. The lower the level of testing, the, it's only ruling in, it's not ruling out. So in plainer English, that means that you can't say, oh, you don't have OSA because the thing came back with a negative. It could be a, it's a false negative in some ways. Uh, because the fact is that apnea and hypopnea may occur without any significant desaturation. And the desaturation can appear for other reasons. So as such, the recommendations to see a, um, a pediatric sleep physician is always the case. Now, um, pulse rate variability uh, or rises are commonly seen in association with obstructive respiratory events on a polytomogram. Like I can tell you that from doing them every day. Um, but during an oximetry screening, the pulse rate analysis may add to blood oxygen interpretation, uh, which I'll show you on an actual readout uh, later on in this lecture. And so in a similar way to the desaturation index, a pulse rate rise index has been validated with a pulse rate rise index of 15 beats a minute in a frequency of greater than 35 events per hour. And this validation has a 97% specificity for obstructive sleep apnea in children. Now, the McGill oximetry um, score uh, is the most common cluster analysis mentioned, uh, like method used in Australasia at this point in children um, over one to two years. So in, clear, in kids with clinically suspected OSA who are also witnessed to have large tonsils and no confounding comorbidities, uh, they also have a pulse oximetry score uh, as well when they've had the test done. They have a 98% positive uh, predictive value uh, for the uh, presence of obstructive sleep apnea. Now, uh, due to the lack of breathing observation in, in pulse oximetry, because there's no nasal cannula, um, you can't rule out the OSA. So I hope that makes it a bit clearer. Um, we should yep. always bear in mind that a child can have severe OSA without desaturation events when they're assessed by a polytomogram. So the reason I mentioned the sensitivity is, um, is because what we're really talking about here is if you've got a child with large adenoids and tonsils or specifically tonsils, because you can't see the adenoids, um, and if you wanted to do a pulse oximeter on them, there still may be a reason to do that. However, if it comes back negative, it doesn't mean that they don't have obstructive sleep apnea. Uh, the next important thing to realize about the, the preoperative oximetry is that the higher the McGill oximetry score, then the higher the risk of a post-operative complication for children having their tonsils removed. So um, in general, OSA increases perioperative risk. However, if a child has oximetry values that are leading to a McGill score of greater than three, then that risk is increased remarkably. So this is another reason to be doing a pulse oximetry screening in preparation for aneroids and tonsil surgery. I mean, uh, Derek, you were saying that um, you, you work with some ENTs, we were just talking this afternoon about it, who, who like routinely get every child uh, has an, uh, uh, like a PSG before they have Radenoids and Any surgery, yeah. correct, yeah. correct, yeah. Yeah, uh, I think this, what I've just been saying there is, is pretty much, you know, like if, if you've got a, what a, why I said all that is because if you've got a parent who's, um, I don't know, a little bit resistant to going the, the full length, I mean, the only way I can um, draw a, an analogy is because, I mean, I, like you're the, you're the kid guy, Derek, I deal with the adults, um, essentially, Sometimes I'll have a dentist call me and they'll say, look, I've got a patient who needs an oral appliance, but he doesn't want to have a sleep test. Can we still do it? It's like, well, you can, but yeah. like, <laughs> do you want to? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, and like, so look, yeah. So essentially that's, that's where I want to go with that. Um, uh, I mean, that, that McGill score there, if you can see, um, I've got to try and look down at my, uh, at, 
you know, I've got to see the thing. Sorry, Derek, but I've got yeah, to see right. it in front that's of right. me. Yeah. Um, so I've just got to look at the. Is it is it on the screen now? Yes. Yeah, I've Miguel, got sorry. Miguel's on my yeah, screen. Yep. Yep. So you can see that the, it's it's not a hard score to actually look at, um, especially if you've got this uh, this this graph with you when you when you get a, a pulse oximetry uh, test back. If you've got um, a score of one, uh, you know it'll be because and I'll be providing this McGill score with the pulse oximetry. It doesn't necessarily come automatically out of the machine, however. You know, you can do it yourself, or if anybody uses the services that I provide, I'll be providing the score anyway, because um, as a sleep scientist, I'm going to be literally scoring it, if you know what I mean. Like, yeah. most of it's automatic, but I'll be counting it up and doing the cluster analysis so that it's um, a little bit more informative for the dentist. But they can do it themselves, and especially with this this graph in front of them, they can. They, it's not hard to do. You don't need to be a rocket scientist to do this. You just count them up, and that's what you've got. Do you see what I mean? Like. It's pretty easy. Um, the desaturation is greater to or equal than a 4% fall in saturation for children. You've got to remember that it's 4%, not 3 Even though there's a lot of research that shows 3%, um, with, with this kind of interpretation, you really want to look at 4% because that's going to uh, take all the, the white noise out of the, out of the issue. Um, and I, I understand you're going to go through some cases um, yeah. Yeah, which is going to prove that even further. Well, I think to, to get it from a clinical um, standpoint, um, you know, we can identify the problem and then to give better uh, affirmation to the parent, you know, we can say, well, listen, and, and I use the machines directly, I just give it to the parents, I think, but you may want to use Chris's services uh, and he can set up a way that he can um, courier out the device to the uh, the people to use. And after you've done a few, I think it's well worth buying your own. I mean, we have mm -hmm. such a big practice. I can't, you know, we, we need going in and out on a regular basis in six locations. That's why this one I love because, uh, well, you, you, you've already shown it, haven't you? The, it's just it's really that, nice. To... Little tiny thing. I mean, it's so automatic. It's so easy. It's idiot proof. Um, I don't mean that facetiously. But it truly is easy, so there's no stress. You put it on, it starts working. You don't have to give them a phone or any fancy equipment. It's just that thing. And and with and before I give that, so I don't want everyone to think that everyone who comes into my surgery gets one of those. There's some pre-screening, right? So exactly. obviously we we've talked about the clinical exam, and and, and I mentioned briefly about Malin party and looking at the uh, uh, the the tonsils in the mouth. This is there's a there's a scale for everything. There's even a scale for outer noise, but obviously you see that radiographically. But in this scale, you can see that if you just um, uh, push the tongue down and look in the back of the throat, you'll be able to see the uvula. If that's red, uh, you know, uh, in, inflamed, uh, you know, you, you know that that's pro probably related to snoring. But the tonsils are a huge one. So grade three and four are the ones that uh, you would refer. And the ear, nose and throat loves referrals from general dentists because they even say to me all the time, "You, yeah, Derek, your students are really more highly educated than a lot of our medical referrals because they get it, you know? So I'm saying if you add to the parent's explanation uh, this, and then you go through this, uh, it's a mnemonic, right, for the bears. So, so what does bears stand for? We keep talking about the bears questionnaire. Well, bedtime issues, you know, um, uh, does your, your kid have trouble going to bed or uh, trouble falling asleep, right? So if they fall asleep super quickly, that could be related uh, to being overtired. If it takes them ages to go to sleep, that could be more related to forms of insomnia. Um, what about during the day? Uh, are they, uh, have, do they suffer from daytime somnolence? In other words, are they uh, sleepy uh, uh, during the day? Uh, and do they have what we call disruptive symptoms. And I think every one of us have kids like that. But, you know, what we used to do, I didn't look and see why the kid was like that. I would just normally refer them to a paediatric dentist who also didn't look, uh, but just put them under general anaesthetic for future work. Do you see what I'm trying to say? Um, so, um, you know, does your kid uh, have uh, uh, trouble with waking up at night? Do they have night terrors? Uh, uh, do they sleepwalk? Do they bed wet, right? Um, and, by, and then, by, sorry, Derek, yeah, but by the yeah. way, if they if they did put them under general to do work on them because they were climbing the walls and they had OSA, 
they're going to have a hard time after they're trying to get them out of that treatment. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Uh, the deoxygenation so, that happens while they're in the journal. Yeah, and in fact, Mal and Party came up with index <laughs> based on uh, on that with the more obese sort of patients, etc. So, um, you know, then R stands for the regularity and, and duration of sleep. And there's some really good YouTube videos that help you understand how to complete all these forms. Um, uh, and then the last one, of course, you know, does your child have noisy breathing or snoring most nights? So these are simple things to do. Um, so Chris in this lecture is going to discuss the practical and uh, technical best practice and also go through the most up-to-date logistics solutions where you can use his services or you can do direct with the patient, as long as you're doing something is what I'm interested in. Um, and what I'm gonna do is go through just quickly the documentation um, that is associated with pulse oximetry, because it's not just the pulse oximeter on its own, right? So if we uh, if we look at, uh, at this uh, Chervin pediatric sleep questionnaire, um, and this was uh, first brought out in research in 2000. Mm. It's intended as an adjunct for the assessment of children and young people with possible sleep disorder breathing, um, and it should not be used to kind of rule it out, right? Um, so what Chervin found that after scoring responses to questions one to 22, uh, with, a, uh, with a one for yes and a zero for no, a mean score greater than 0.33 had a sensitivity of 81%, which is, you know, if you, you know your stats, that's huge, and a specificity of 87% um, for obstructive sleep apnea in children aged 2 to 18 years, um, as defined by a proper PSG where the AHI was greater than 5. So there's huge correlations between this. So again, I don't want sleep physicians to jump up and down saying, what are you doing? You know, this is our domain. No, <laughs> what we're saying is that, <laughs> yeah, there is um, a high correlation between this and even getting to the sleep study. Mm. And what would you prefer? Nothing being done or at least this as a precursor. And this is what we're all about, right? Um, so for an example, an individual who has five yes responses and 13 no responses scores five over 18 or 0.28, right? So while the score does not load responses, the first seven responses were deemed the highest predictors for sleep disorder breathing. So again, that's another sort of tool in your toolbox. Okay, so let's get to the clinical side of things, right? This is a 10 year old with habitual snoring and just, um, let's see what we see from the data. Now, the new machine, you can actually plug it in and get this data directly. Or if you're um, you know, lazy and or extremely busy, <laughs> they're the two, <laughs> two extremes, um, you can get Chris to do it. Because Chris, Chris doesn't sleep at night, he just he dreams about these little spikes. Uh, uh, you know, not just the spikes in Melbourne now, uh, but... Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm actually a zombie, so yeah. <laughs> So, so, so this kid just gives a background. We, we looked at the tonsils and this kid had grade three tonsils. The mum reports regular snoring, right? Uh, observations, um, uh, slept as usual, uh, according to mum that night, uh, but was snoring all night, right? So, um, what's the study? Eight, um, half, eight and a half hours, uh, recording, uh, on the, uh, uh oximeter, uh, with two second averaging. Satisfactory signal quality, no editing, right? What are the results? Well, Chris probably know more than that, but I can tell you I can see the mean saturations of 98% uh, with 0.6% time below 90%. That's the dangerous thing. So that's a 3% desaturation index. Um, uh, yeah, Mass Massimo will use 3%. Yeah. Um, so we know. The, 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 the duck bill? That's yeah. That's a 3% desaturation. Yeah. So, um, you know, I think you mentioned McGill earlier, McGill score of three, yeah. uh, you know, uh, so I think what's the interpretation? Well, that's highly suggestive of obstructive sleep apnea. And it's a great way for me to explain to the parent, hey, you need to go and see my mate Greg Lavoff because the kids' tonsils are just, you know, kissing each other. Uh, or, 
you know, maybe it's time we get a uh, a full on PSG, et cetera, et cetera. But at least the parents come back and they're more. Um, and plus, I give them stuff to read associated with these findings, right? So, um, uh, what happens with kids who come back to me after the nose and throat doctor uh, has done T's and A's? Because remember, T's and A's may not be the full solution. As I've said to you in my PhD research, T's and A's are sometimes the start. Then I have to expand the palate, bring the lower jaw forward. After that, we have to do myofunctional therapy. Now, after all of these, the parents aren't going to fork out necessarily for another full sleep study, but the oxygen saturations uh, uh, are, are a guide, right? So this is a, an, another way we can use this. So, um, um, so that's one example. Chris, anything else you want to add on that particular case? Well, on that particular case, you can see those desaturations are indicative of, well, um, without sounding vague, but with something going on. Because as a scientist, I can't say, oh, it's definitely this. But yeah. like, what what uh, alarms me more is you've got these massive desaturations for even a short period of time. But the reality is that there's no pulse increase. Yeah. So the body's not trying to fight. Now, that's a severity index. Because, and I think that you'll you'll note that um, you know a full PSG was done on this same patient, and they said that it was moderate. So, you know that that's good. It's better to overstate than understate with something. Uh, ruling in uh, OSA, and then PSG shows moderate, and in a child moderate of eight point four, that's that's severe. Yeah, wouldn't you agree? Yeah, absolutely. Because I, and on that point, for those who don't understand sleep scales, for adults, when we talk about, uh, AHI, RDI, you know, uh, for a female, you know, like, uh, five would be normal, seven for a male, for a child, zero is normal, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And even one is abnormal. So this is, yeah. So it's a different, uh, so really. Shall you move on to these, the six year old? Um, so this child had a history of snoring and was awaiting uh, a uh, uh, appointment uh, on the public uh, list to have the adenoids and tonsils removed, right? Um, so uh, mum reports habitual snoring without any other concerns during sleep. Um, we suspect possible obstructive sleep apnea uh, on the night of using the uh, um, Massimo uh, oximeter. The observations were uh, slept as usual and slept well. So the study was for 11 hours, 15 minutes uh, on the recording um, and two second averaging, good signal quality, um, apart from a brief signal loss at the start of the night. So results, mean saturation of 98% with 0.1% time below 90%. That's 3% um, desaturation index uh, and um, your uh, McGill symmetry score of one. So, Chris, that interpretation, if you lead us through. Well, and and on the subject of the the last one, I did forget to mention that that last person, uh, little kid, ten year old kid, uh, you know, eight eight and a half hours of sleep. Did an alarm wake them up? You know what I mean? That's not a that's not actually a normal amount of sleep for a ten year old. And yeah, yeah, yeah. whereas the whereas the indication for the um, the next one, sorry, I'm just trying to juggle through my slides here. The the indication for the uh, six-year-old at 11 hours and 15 minutes, that's a tell right there. That there's, and I'm not trying to be judgy about this, but there's a set of parents who are getting their child the right amount of sleep, putting them to bed early enough. And then the 10-year-old either won't stay in bed or is going to bed too late. Does that make sense? Like, so, yeah, yeah. And, and so right there and then the pulse oximetry is actually recording the amount of time they're, they're sleeping in bed. And it's not up to a dentist to tell the parent to tell the kid to get better uh, sleep hygiene. But the point is that, um, is it perhaps that this child with the moderate apnea before the one that we're talking about now um, actually couldn't sleep because he was being woken up by the desaturations? Yeah. You know, because at the end of that night, I did notice there was a lot more pulse transition time change which is indicative of uh, heart rate increase and um, potentially cortical arousal. With with this one, again, near the end of the night, you'll see there's a there's a pulse increase there. You can see the, the bottom line is the pulse increase. The top one's the desaturation of the oxygen. Uh, and the clusters of the oxygen desaturations aren't really as desperate as the previous study. Yeah. So 
So in theory, that could be inconclusive for our yeah. sake. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Now, let's look at one more study, just because uh, I think we got this show off the road a bit late because of technical problems. But because um, uh, I like them to understand just like, you know, I know what most dentists are like. They're going to say, OK, OK, we get it. We get it. How can we incorporate it into practice? So <laughs> he, he, he's a he's a 10 year old uh, uh, from the medical history, uh, obesity, habitual snoring and reported breathing difficulties during sleep um, has previously um uh had t's and a's uh removed um and if you look at what's going on um uh in in this uh study that's uh, over nine hours isn't it right mm. looking at that graph mm. yeah um two second averaging uh signal quality was good mean saturations of 96 percent with 0.1 percent time below 90. so um the three percent desaturation index 26 per hour 10% to saturated index 0.2 per hour. Um, so, uh, so that I think uh, without doubt would be obstructive sleep apnea. What, what's yeah. your thoughts on that, Chris? Yeah, it's severe apnea. I mean, yeah. it just is. Like a, you're a 10 year old with an AHI of 11. And th this is one of the reasons I did my, what well, well, prompted me to do my PhD, because I was getting kids back like this after T's and A's where the parents would say to me, why do I pay all that money to get my tonsil and androids removed? My kid doesn't sleep any better and they mm. still snore. And I was like, oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and then I realized that there's a thing known as residual AHI. Mm. And depending on who you read, some of these kids may have an apneic, let's pick a figure, an apneic index of 12, which is pretty bad, right? Yeah, yeah. And then after T's and A's, they drop to six. But the thing is, they're nowhere near normal, right? But in, med but in medicine, a 50% improvement is actually deemed a very medical miracle. So the way I got those kids from 12 to 6 and then 6 to 0 was my functional therapy, um, you know, stopping those muscles uh, um, collapsing. Remember all those muscles above the hyoid bone, they are what keep the, 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 the uh, pharynx um, uh, open at night. And, and, of course, changing the size of the jaws so we can accommodate the tongue. And there's so much to go into. So I, I want people to understand that at least what you're doing here is getting the right screening done so you can yeah. send the kid to the right person. Um, Triaging. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so Chris, uh, let's, let's, let's just, you, 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 you take over from here because this explains the technical side of the pulse oximeter. Yeah. And I won't spend too long on this bit. I mean, it's, uh, there's a cute, um, uh, what do you call that? An acronym or an acronym? Acronym. acronym? Uh, there's a cute acronym, sexy darling, you know, 600 wavelength deoxyhemoglobin absorbs red light. So if you're going to buy a pulse oximeter, you've got to make sure that it's actually doing the right job. And that means it's got to be measuring the light at the right Newton meters. So pulse oximetry refers to a technology which estimates the arterial oxygen saturation based first on the detection of a pulsatile blood flow and then secondly on differing absorption and the spectra of the oxyhemoglobin and the deoxyhemoglobin um, it's it's that difference there that that you're going to get your reading on in a percentage that makes sense to everybody most commonly available pulse oximeters uh, they've got leds in them that emit light at 660 newton meters which is the red light and 940 newton meters so every you know, it doesn't matter how expensive or cheap a thing is. If it doesn't have those two wavelengths, that is the gold standard. It's a bit like Massimo is a technology that everybody relies on for pulse oximetry. And these are the standards that we, that, that we rely on uh, to, for, that to, for the thing to actually work properly. So I've got that slide up there that just shows you, you know, how it's shining through the, uh, the thing. And now the interesting thing is that, that that's a slide out of a, I mean, you can look it up. It's, it's called um, How Stuff Works. And it is showing a pulse oximeter in the basic sense of what a pulse oximeter has been uh, in, the, in the previous time. These pulse oximeters have advanced now. They don't go through the top and the bottom of the finger anymore. They go through the side. And you're better off to wear a pulse oximeter either on the pinky or on the thumb. If you wear it in the middle, you get less perfusion. So I just want you to, to realize that. And just in the past, Eric, as you know, we were putting them on the ring finger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah. They're, they're better off to be on the extremities because that's where the pulse is actually greater. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the, the the position 
of the opposite side of the patient, uh, you know, of the finger is most usually a finger because you've, you know, it's thin. Uh, and the signal processor is uh, in the pulse oximeter compares the ratio of absorption between the two uh, spectrums against a set of stored reference values. So the signal sample frequently, um, it, it, it's 25 times a second by the pulse uh, oximeter. I mean, there's light, you know, light's fast. Yeah. And recorded output is usually averaged over a set of period, two to 16 seconds um, uh, or heartbeats. So it's referred to um, as the averaging time. So. Uh, the longer the averaging time, uh, the, the the longer the averaging time is the the the, the eight to sixteen seconds. The signal artifact uh, from motion, um, but it reduces the ability to detect a rapid change in desaturation that's seen with um, central obstructive uh, sleep apnea. Now that's more important in a PSG because a pulse oximeter is not going to give you those those that data. But what I'm suggesting um, that it's um, basically it's an indication of airway events, and the addition of, of the data is influenced by the study resolution, which is the um, the frequency that's the result saved in the oximeter. So those uh, those ductal ones probably are going to be less accurate then. Yeah, because the reality is that whilst they're um, sampling quite highly, uh, when that movement happens, the, the sampling. Uh, and I've showed, I actually write in my studies artifact um, mm -hmm. because uh, when a duck bill moves, uh, the oximetry drops because it's, it is still sampling and it thinks it's reading a lower oximetry, but it's not, it's reading artifact. So, and then also, I guess, I guess with the duck bill, you've got the problem, I don't know, with females uh, with nail polish. All of that stuff. This is, this eliminates all that. It's a fan, like yeah. when I saw these come out, I thought, oh, they got to be a joke, right? Like how? Oh, this is accurate. They're incredible. The, the technology in there is it's a world beater. So I'm very pleased that they've, they've come out with these, this design. And, you know, I'm a design guy. So, you know, when I see a better design, I'm going to crow about it because it's just, I think it's terrific that people are putting their hats on and thinking. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it, it, it avoids all that stuff like you were talking about, the you know, nail polish, um, you know, shellac. Great things at Shellac. In fact, if I can show the next slide that shows um, the difference, say, between what up till now we've been using compared to this little baby. I mean, you can just see uh, uh, you know, the, the size is, is much yeah, easier I mean, for the pediatric population. That, and uh, that that barely fits on my finger, but but I mean it it's it's just there. It's like a ring. And then you've got the adult one, which is larger. So. You know, having as you know, as you do, you've got the the two of them because you've got a sixteen year old boy who plays football. He's not going to fit in this thing. <laughs> yeah. He needs the other one. He needs a wrist worn one. But the, it's the same technology. Um, it's just for a little kid to put a wrist worn one on. You can do it, but um, the little finger one is much better because the kids' little fingers don't move as much as the big fingers. So you know that's not a problem that it's on a on the finger is what I'm saying. It's it's not a duck bill. Um, you know, so uh, in the end, um, I mean, the, the issues that, that, that this new, it, it just surrounds the finger and it's unlike the most expensive uh, Messerman technology that still uh, uses the duckbill style of uh, end of finger attachment. I mean, man, I'm, I'm just begging for Philips to come out with something like that to go on my Medicare funded sleep test because I have a bit of trouble with uh, pulse oximetry and those things. Well, I know I uh, I do my yearly sleep test through you, and um, uh, you just did it, yeah. Yeah, and and uh, I, I I will admit the um, the the Philips Restronicus machine I think I was using um that that is annoying during sleep, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Like it, of course it is. You know, like so. I'm like in this um, I've forgotten what slide we're up to, mate. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, um, I'm the, 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 oh, there we are. Yep. Yeah. I've got it. I got, I got myself back. So, I mean, like that, that technology, um, is, is a world beater. Um, I mean, you don't have to believe us. You can go to like, I, I don't sell these things personally. I recommend well you and you buy it off them. Um, uh, if you want to get your own, but, but I just want to give you a tip. You see in that picture, I've, I've on purpose put the, um, the computer behind the phone 
to show the report. You see that there on the screen, every pulse oximeter you buy off this company, if it doesn't have that picture of the report on the computer, it's not going to give it to you. So make sure that you buy the right one. Don't go, oh, that one's about 10 bucks cheaper because you'll, you'll miss out on some really cool stuff. Um, so look, if you, if you just can't get your head around it, you're busy, especially in these COVID times, I'm, I, I've got to tell you, I'm, I'm finding a lot of, um, a lot of dentists are, are reaching out to me for assistance on all sorts of things now. It's, uh, it's an amazing time of the year and I feel bad for a lot of uh, communities that are suffering through this COVID pandemic. Um, if you're just trying to keep your head above water as some surgeries are and you, you just don't really want to go buying all that sort of stuff, you can actually use our service even to get you started. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a simple service to use. Uh, Basically, on the next slide, you can see that if you uh, if you click on the um, yeah, there it is. Yep, yep. If you go to our website and and you click on the kids pulse oximetry uh, screening uh, site, you can you can then see that what comes up is that bears questionnaire. It's ready to fill out, so you could actually you know you might have a tablet in your in your waiting room and you might have the 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 parents fill that out right there. And they're short answer questions. So the parents actually has to write, oh, you know, they go to bed at 10, they wake up at seven, that kind of thing. Derek's very used to this questionnaire. I've put it in a digital form so that uh, when you fill it out on that website, uh, they put your, your email address in. And as soon as they hit the submit button, you get a copy of that form. Um, then you can look at the form and <laughs> I mean, you can tell them, well, you know, it might be a good idea to do a screening uh, and, and that, that can get the parent to, to do the screening. So the parent will fill out the questionnaire. Uh, on the next slide, you'll see there's the beginning of it. You can see how it's um, maybe the next one after that. I think I've jumped ahead. Well, that's, um, uh, that's the one that's got the bears screening form. Yeah, you go to the next yep. slide and it shows you the, the first question, for example. So they, you know, that's... That's what you're used to, isn't it, Derek? Yep. The, you yep. know, difficult falling asleep, that sort of thing. Um, then they, when they uh, go to the next screen, you'll see what, what you can see there. Let's go to the next slide. You see the, the bear screening questionnaire on the left. That's what comes to them on an email now. Derek knows that I'm very particular about HIPAA information, at the, like since I've become educated on privacy. Uh, so they'll actually get that bears questionnaire. It doesn't have anything really private on it. It's just got a name. Uh, if you use our service, you'll get the other form on the right, which is uh, you know something that's printable and it's savable as a document. Uh, and on the next slide, you'll see uh, the report that comes out of the machine itself. Now, this is, this is uh, one that I just did on my wife, just to show you, um, like, because she's got little fingers. So uh, it, you can see the desaturation there at about, uh, what is that, 257. Um, that desaturation is accompanied with some pulsatile increase, which means basically she was having a little bit of a cute little snore and, uh, and then she moved and got out of it again. So, um, I mean, I was witness to that because as Derek said, I'm a zombie and I don't get any sleep. Uh, so, um, you know, that that's a standard of the report. And then we actually add the, the Sherman report in, and we add the Bears question, we put it all together so that you've got something that's really good for your records, because I think record keeping is very important. So on the next slide, you can see how, um, you know, you can, you could actually use that QR code that's on the right there if you want to get your own pulse oximeter. And you, you know, if you click into that, you can actually, um, by using that code and, and actually using the coupon code Air Healthcare, you can get 10% off actually buying these things if that's what you want to do or you can contact us and we can help you out with the screening you can get you know try before you buy thing and um you know help your patients in the meantime uh they're not expensive devices are they mate they're just no no in fact for for what they pick up yeah uh and the good thing is you don't you're not paying the cost of the consumables per per patient which is fantastic because they're rechargeable but yeah that that clever thing there is how they they, they really lock you in, I guess, because that without that USB-style connection cable, 
you can't download the uh, app on the computer. Yeah. So my battery's flashing on my camera, mate. I'm glad I'm at the end of the uh, lecture. Right, right. <laughs> it's, it's looking uh, like it's going to die on me. So, well, because, um, because, because we saw a bit late, what I'll probably ask people to do, I'm going to leave this presentation up on the four Facebooks, Derek Mahoney 1, 2, 3 and 4, for the next four days. Um, put questions in there in the comment section. I'm happy to uh, yeah. answer them with Chris's um, assistance. Um, but uh, then we're going to move this to the platform eodo.teachable.com. So, you know, it's just anyone you know that uh, dealing with kids uh, and uh, getting into uh, dental sleep medicine, this is a really powerful adjunct. So just to summarise what Chris and I have been trying to present today. Okay, so we know from statistics that a high percentage of kids have sleep disorder breathing problems. As they get older, that actually worsens. And then you've got the teenagers who you add years of not sleeping well to mental health issues, depression, and teenage suicide. So it's a big deal, right? So the question is, what are you doing to try and help that? Well, how about you take it on board that starting tomorrow in your practice, you make a ruling that you're going to ask the right questions for every paediatric patient that comes in, or is it going to hurt you to give everyone a best questionnaire, right? Now, from that, you can then talk to the parent, ask certain questions. You know, I always ask the, the classical thing of, you know, uh, how's your kid going at school? What's his, is he hyperactive? Did the, uh, you know, um, uh, and then I look in the mouth. And then when I see certain things in the mouth, such as, you know, uh, uh, large tonsils or, um, uh, uh, a battered uh, uh, uvula, uh, venous pooling, you know, all this sort of stuff. It just adds to the picture. And so it's great then to say, look, why don't we just do this? It's a very inexpensive thing to do. And if that shows, like we showed you in those three studies, uh, you need to go off. And do this. Sometimes that's enough for them to say, right, that's it. I'm signing up. I want to go and um, get um my T's and A's are looked at with the you know, and throat doctor. Or, yes, I understand that other than my kid's class two jaw, they has airway problems. And so, you know, then they don't look at it as like we're just straightening up the four teeth. Why would you want to do that at seven when my cousin had the braces at 14? I say, well, look, because your kid has this sort of problem. So that's how we use it in clinical practice. And, you know, if you're ever in Sydney, um, feel free to drop past one of my practices and you can see on a daily basis how we do consults and how when I do my case presentations after we look at records, part of my records for every patient, I'm adult, still, child. I'm still here, by the way. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Uh, um, oh, yeah, you've lost your, your okay. Yeah, lost uh, for, for, for every adult, uh, for every child, I add airway questionnaires and airway screenings into the protocol. So, Chris, I think we'll probably – anything else you want to add before we uh, end it? Uh, this is this is me uh, as the invisible man. Uh, okay. Other than that, um, uh, I haven't tried to go pushing any particular product tonight. What I'm talking about is let's help you help your patients. And so that's why I gave you both options. Like I can help you or you can get your own thing and do it yourself. Like, But feel free to contact me if you need any more information. I've been doing this for a long time. And uh, if you send an email, uh, info at DerekMahoney.com, um, what uh, I'm happy to do is share the slides and also some of those um, papers and the uh, – hang on, let me see if I can work how to do this. Uh, there we go. So I haven't got my – so info <laughs> at – that's working, isn't it? <laughs> DerekMahoney.com. And it's without the E in the Mahoney. That's where most people make the error. Now, if you send an email there and just say, look, we saw your presentation uh, on the pediatric pulse oximeter. Uh, can you give us more information? We're happy to send you those forms, the references. Um, and then, you know, why don't you try, if you're in Australia, New Zealand, you can use Chris's services. But if you're outside, off. I might, I might add that yep. bears quest that bears questionnaire that's on my website is totally yep. free, and they can use it without any fear of, you know, anything. They just use it, and the thing will come straight to them. So that pre-screening, I've I've put it up there to help them to get started. They can just Perfect. find it out online. Yeah. Um. And uh, you know, where are we? I think we're on the going Sorry, back to the right side. Yeah. And there you go. So, and then take a can they take a photo now of that? What's it called? QR code or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, the, the yeah. link is there, but the QR code, 
if they just point their camera at that and, and then yep. click on the link, it'll yep. they can save the link in their phone. Okay, and they'll go straight to that. So, uh, yeah, so if you're outside of Australia, New Zealand, where we're not offering the ability of you just sending the patient to the website for help, then think about getting uh, one of these um, uh, machines. I think it'll, it'll pay itself off. You know, it's up to you what you charge wherever, but um, I think it's a great service for the... Uh, for the, the the parents and the uh, and the kids um, that you're treating, and why I recommend this company is because they literally sell this thing worldwide. Mm -hmm. They're yeah, worldwide, you know, like that USD at the top there. You click on that, and you've got any denomination you want. So it's really, it's really a clever company. I'm very yes. pleased with them. Perfect. All right, Chris. Thanks again. And uh, now tune in again, same time. Hopefully, we'll run on time this time because of the. Uh, you know, who has staff that know that you've got a lecture at seven and they book in your last patient at uh, six and knowing you have an hour to get home? Do you have those staff, Chris? <laughs> no, I I, uh, I killed them all. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was almost going to I was almost going to zoom zoom in the back of the car. Uh, remember? And then I said, "Oh my God, now just yeah." So, <laughs> yeah, so you look, did ring we, me from the back of your car. <laughs> yeah. So we we will we will promise you that part two. So we've got three parts of this series. Chris, tell them about um, the next one, which is next Thursday at seven. What's the topic? Well, the first thing I wanted to say was I better say, I better give a shout out to Gillian, who is my COO, because yep. she actually does. She does a great job. Great keeps job. Keeps me sane, and I don't want anybody saying I didn't say that. <laughs> 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 oh, dear. Yeah. So, um, you know, I'll be in trouble tomorrow. Uh, she's got a sixth sense. Uh, in terms of next week, uh, and thanks for giving me the opportunity to do these lectures, Derek, uh, because it's, uh, it's terrific to be able to get out there and give information to people um, on mass. You know? uh, so next but be, be, be ready for it. The, the social media is a double-edged sword. You know, you're going to get like 5,000 emails. Are you ready for that? <laughs> well, that, that's what Gillian's there for. <laughs> yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that's why she's so great. Yes, <laughs> good, good. Okay. So, so the lockdown advert, uh, it's it's basically, it's not an advertisement. It's more like uh, we're going to have a discussion, aren't we, about Yes, the, it's, like, it's like this. In, in, fact, in fact, why don't people get back to us? Did they like this sort of, I wanted to have like a format almost like a, talk show you know where we, we say well what you know the, having a beer with chris and derek is what i want to call it and uh, chris said i oh, don't know maybe that wouldn't go down well in certain <laughs> certain countries well i had a glass um, of wine uh. <laughs> uh, um so so yeah so so 7 p.m next thursday and again the following thursday so three thursdays in a row 7 p.m we're going to be talking about how you as a dentist can incorporate dental sleep medicine to your office. And it's really the future because a lot more people have sleep disorder breathing problems in your dental office than those who have gum disease or have decay. And certainly for the love of God that need implants. I can't believe because the number of dentists bloody spend all their dough learning how to place implants. And they ask them, how many did you do last year? Um, and they said, oh, I placed five. Uh, and I said, what, all year? I said, yeah. You know. <laughs> and I said, well, I, I did five sleep studies per day. Uh, and out of that, um, you know, uh, I did X number of appliances and blah, 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 blah. You know, yeah. anyway. I'd like to give a shout out to Damien. You know, Damien. Damien yeah, Damien Teo. Yeah. He, in this, in, in, he's in Victoria, right? Now, yep. some, yep. Of his, some of his uh, places that he goes to work in are in some of these so called hotspots. He is still flat chat. Because yeah. it, because he's dealing with, he's helping people with sleep disorder breathing. Um, yeah. And yeah, you know, do, do you know? Do you know? Who, remember, we had this discussion during that three weeks we were locked down. Um, uh, I got so many emails about snoring because guess what? I think people were cohabitating together more, yeah. and uh, you know that's not a good thing for some relationships. Oh, it, uh -huh. hasn't, it hasn't proven to be a good thing for some yeah. relationships. And, and, and that's why I was getting, I sent you so many sleep studies and yeah. it was easy to do because I didn't even have to consult the patient. We did teleconferencing and I asked certain questions and, um, and then you were still able to get the machine out to them. So actually it was a pretty booming sort of time. So you need, so for general, for a general dentist, you need a plan B, right? Mm -hmm. what, what else can you do in your practice that helps your patient? We're not trying to sell charcoal toothpaste okay <laughs> uh where where 
um, actually doing something that the patient's going to love you for because they're going to feel better, their kid's going to get better grades at school and be less annoying, you know. Uh, I didn't realise why some animals eat their young until my kids became teenagers. Um, <laughs> but then now in hindsight, you know, I, I, I knew nothing about all this at, 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 at their age. And had I known, I probably would have, you know, taken the bloody iPad off and given them um, uh, more standard uh, routines. I mean, thank God they all turned out well. But um, it's just that the more you know, the more you're armed with, the more you can help everyone, including your own kids. Yeah. All um, right, Chris, we'll, 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 we better we better end that because uh, yeah, it's... But, uh, but, but next week is going to be like, what what can we tell from yeah. like about a bruxism and a TMD patient? Great. How can Perfect. we help them? That's what we're, we're discussing that. Excellent. All right. We'll see you then. Tune in again uh, next Thursday and uh, send us an email. Bye. Yeah, bye-bye.